Will someone give me the cue to start? Ricardo, I'll give you the, the cue. I thought we'd wait until like two or three after. So I'll, I'll give you the cue. Understood. Should I go video off after I finish? Yes, you can just um, turn off your video uh, after you're finished. Understood. Again, thank you very much for all of you and um, hoping for the best. Really appreciate. Thanks to you, Ricardo. Great. Good beginning and uh, many thanks. Ricardo, why don't you why don't you start and kick us off? Good evening, my friends. Greetings from Mexico City to the NYU community and friends from all over the world. My name is Ricardo Kumar Dadu, and I'm founder and president of Stern's Mexico chapter. I received my MBA from NYU in 1984. I work in Mexico City as operating partner for the Clarendon Group, which is a private equity fund and M&A advisor based in Metro DC, purely focused in North American logistics and transportation. I'm happy to share with you today that this year we're celebrating our 30th anniversary of the Stern Mexico chapter. And we're so very happy and honored to celebrate this occasion with our own professor, Ed Altman, who will discuss the state of the credit markets. Thank you very much, professor. To introduce Professor Altman, I'm grateful to my friend and moderator, Pedro David Martinez, for proactively organizing this event and also for relaunching the Monterrey Alumni Association. Pedro David Martinez is the founder and managing director of Regis Capital, a leading independent advisory firm that provides global investment management services to family offices and institutional investors. Mr. Martinez graduated in 2006 with an MBA in finance from the NYU Stern School of Business and has a diploma, among others, in private equity and venture capital from HBS. Over the past 20 years, Pedro has selected investments in sectors such as advertising, AI, CPG, e-commerce, energy, digital media, health, fintech, industrial real estate, telecom, and transportation. He has worked in leadership positions at top-tier investment firms in New York City, and his expertise is in portfolio management, including IPOs, high-yield, 
private equity and venture capital. Thank you again, all of you. Thank you for joining us in this we uh, webinar. And Pedro, you can take it from here. Thank you, Ricardo, and congratulations for the third year anniversary. I'm very proud to represent the NYU alumni community here in Monterey. I'm very pleased to welcome NYU alumni, friends, and distinguished guests from all over the world to this virtual meeting, COVID-19 and the crisis cycle. I hope you and your family are safe and healthy during these challenging times. I would like to take this opportunity to thank NYU and all those who have given their active support to organize this event. Today, we are honored to have Professor Ed Alman, the Max Heim Professor Emeritus of Finance at the NYU Stern School of Business. Dr. Alman is a Director of Research in Credit and Debt Markets at the NYU Salomon Center for the Study of Financial Institutions. Dr. Alman has an international reputation as an expert on corporate bankruptcy, high yield, distressed debt, and credit risk analysis. Dr. Alman created the C-Score in 1968, a credit risk model that remains today a widely used method of predicting corporate defaults. He has been a consultant to several government agencies and major financial institutions. Dr. Alman has been chairman of the Academic Council of the Turnaround Management Association since 2002. Welcome, Professor Alman, and thank you for accepting our invitation. To participants, uh, be mindful that you can submit questions by clicking Q&A tab in the Zoom and screen, and we will try to address them towards the end of the session. Next slide, please. So as a result of the COVID crisis, uh, the US economy is expected to contract 5% by the end of 2020. During the global financial crisis, the U.S. economy contracted 2.5%. In terms of magnitude, the coronavirus shock will be about two times the one we experienced back in 2009. The Fed-induced recovery since March 23rd has been remarkable. In particular, in April 9, the Fed announced that it will be supportive of the so-called fallen angels. However, despite unprecedented levels of stimulus by the Fed and U.S. Congress, we have seen significant increase in corporate default activity. According to Regis Capital Estimates, <clears throat> year to date, we have north of $185 billion in corporate defaults. As we can see in the slide, we are close to surpass the 2009 record of $200 billion. So Professor, where are we in the credit cycle and we should, what should we expect going forward? Thank you very much, Pedro. Good evening, everyone. Ricardo, congratulations as well for me. I remember meeting you in Mexico City uh, some years ago, and you were very kind to me and my son, so thank you very much. Thank you also to the Alumni Association, to uh, Aaron Malone, Erica Marin, Jennifer as well, and everyone there who decided on having this uh, webinar. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you today uh, and to speak with so many of you from all over the world, spearheaded, of course, by the Mexican and Latin American group, one of my absolute favorites in my teaching experience at NYU, and I hope that many of you uh, remember your classes fondly. We at NYU, like most other universities in the world, are going through a very difficult, challenging time. And students this year are being uh, asked to participate with us uh, in that challenging time. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's given someone like myself a great uh, opportunity to study what goes on in the markets, in the country, in the global situation. So while, as you know, the subject matter will be COVID-19 and the credit cycle, which is a very general topic, but one will zero in on many aspects of it, a subtopic that I'm going to cover will be kind of more of a debate issue because we have never seen 
in a recession, in a, certainly in a pandemic or in a financial crisis, such a great expansion of debt in the world, and particularly in the United States in the corporate sector. So keep that in mind as a subtopic as we go through the analysis. Pedro mentioned also the concept of fallen angels, that is investment grade companies being downgraded to non-investment grade. Well, actually this doesn't come as a surprise to me. Yes, many of them have been the subject to the COVID-19 situation and probably would not have been downgraded uh, given that situation. But many of them were vulnerable even before COVID-19. So I'd like to now go to my slides and the next slide, please. One of the questions we are going to uh, go through is where we were before COVID-19 and of course, what's happened since. Since this is a global group, my focus will start with the global situation but then zero in primarily in the US. And again, that corporate debt buildup will be front and center to our discussion. Next slide. So globally, if you look at indebtedness before COVID-19 started, particularly at the end of 2019, this chart shows the four major areas of debt that comprise global debt, non-financial corporates, government, the financial sector, banks, insurance companies, etc., and household debt. In every case, there have been a dramatic increase in debt over the last 20 years, far, far more than inflation would dictate. So for example, for non-financial corporate debt, 20 plus years ago, 64% of corporate debt was as a percentage of GDP. Today, that number is 93%. I'm sorry, not today, at the end of 2019. It's even higher today. So you're talking about a 50% increase, not in debt only, but as a percentage of a growing GDP number. Government debt increased from 58% of GDP to 88% another dramatic increase. Financial sector, well, it had increased dramatically before the great financial crisis of 2008-09, and it leveled off at around 80, 81, 82% of GDP since. Of course, it was mandated by the various regulators of the world to deleverage financial debt, bank debt in particular, since the great financial crisis. It's the only area that was mandated through legislation. And finally, household debt uh, going from 42% to 60% globally of GDP. Overall, the amount of global debt from these four sectors has increased by more than 100 percentage points. So one of the underlying economic factors, you should keep in mind that the growth of global GDP and global productivity is primarily, I believe, on the backs of low-cost debt, because in this period, particularly the last 10 years, debt has been extremely cheap and companies, governments, et cetera, are taking great advantage of it, but perhaps too much for our future. And I'll come back to that. Next slide. This shows in the US, the growth of investment grade debt and high yield debt. I happen to be a great believer and uh, observer of the high yield junk bond sector. Some of you may remember that from my classes. I was very lucky back in 1982 to be asked by Morgan Stanley to do a white paper, if you will, to help them make a decision back then 
as to whether to get involved in this new market called junk bonds. Well, uh, that gave me the stimulus uh, and the incentive to study this market. And I've been studying it ever since. And of course, it's the inventory, the breeding grounds for corporate defaults that Pedro mentioned earlier today. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the growth in 2020, mostly since COVID-19 became apparent in the US in early March, the growth in investment grade debt on a weekly and monthly basis so far in 220 versus the prior five years, 2019, et cetera. And you could see this incredible paradox that we're experiencing of a global recession and a serious recession in the US and a pandemic, and yet a huge increase in debt that is both embraced by companies and by investors alike. On the right hand side, you see that growth again in 2020 versus prior years in the high yield sector. Together, next slide please. Together, the debt level as a percentage of EBITDA, as you may remember, earnings before interest and taxes and depreciation and amortization, it's kind of a debt to cash flow ratio uh, for companies, uh, has accelerated from around four for um, high yield to um, five and a half times, and for investment grade from a little over two to three and a half. And debt to EBITDA among leveraged buyouts, and by the way, LBOs play a very important and very uh, dominant role in corporate restructurings. Uh, that debt to EBITDA ratio has increased to six times. And if you look at what the regulators have always said, that any company with a five and a half or six times debt to EBITDA ratio is flirting with extreme credit risk. And yet now it's the average, meaning that 50% or so are more than that. <laughs> so keep that in mind too. Half of the companies in the LBO space primarily middle market companies, but also bigger ones and smaller ones, are already in a highly risky financial situation in 2019, before COVID-19. So don't believe everything you read that says, the reason why we have so many bankruptcies and defaults is because of COVID-19. My thesis is we would have had it regardless of the stimulus or the catalyst. In this case, it was the pandemic, unfortunately. But it could have been something else. And usually the catalyst is something we didn't expect, which is exactly what kind of happened this time, although some scientists certainly did expect it, and medical people, but they didn't know when. Next slide. Now, some of the skeptics out there about this debt level being a problem point to the fact that you can measure company debt, particularly relative to equity. And if you measure equity in market value terms rather than book value, the level of debt to equity ratio in 2019, you can see on the right hand side, was very low, historically quite low, and they'd be correct. The stock market was booming, and debt levels, when high, while high, were not that high relative to market equity. I question that thesis among my academic uh, colleagues because I was concerned with what would happen if the stock market took a big hit and dropped dramatically. 20%, 30%, 40% drop in the overall market. And so those scenarios one, two, and three 
show the level of debt equity given that drop. And that's exactly what happened in March of this year. 20%, 30%, almost 40% drop. Now the fact that it has recovered just about all of that, well, not for most companies, but mainly with the technology sector leading the way, to me doesn't diminish the risk of the debt levels. It just diminishes the current debt to equity, which is misleading, and I'll tell you why. Because a lot of that equity increase is coming from just a few companies, a half a dozen of the giant technology companies that you all know. Next slide. So how to tell where we are in the credit cycle? I look at five factors. There are more than five, but if you look at too many, you get confused. So here are the five I concentrate on. Default rates, current and forecasted. The historic average of high yield bond default rates are 3.3% per year. Recovery rates, loss given default. The historic average, 45 cents on the dollar. I'll show you later on some relationship between default and recovery rates. And I don't know if uh, Brooks Brady is on the line listening in, but uh, I see that he's registered. Uh, uh, an old friend of mine uh, from Utah who uh, worked with me on that study. Required returns, that is the risk premium that investors are requiring relative to the so-called risk-free rate, the government bond rate, historically at 5.3%. I also look at something called the distress ratio. That's the percentage of high-yield bonds selling at more than 10% over the risk-free rate. And the historic average is about 10%, coincidentally, 10% of the high-yield market is at any point in time, on average, distressed. It was as high as 80% back in 2008, and it reached the peak of around 40% of junk bonds selling more than 10% over in uh, late March of this year. And finally, the liquidity in the markets. And particularly, I look at new issues of risky debt. Uh, next slide, please. Now this slide is really important, so I'd like you to focus on it because it tells a very important message. The blue line represents non-financial corporate debt, all but banks and insurance companies, as a percentage of GDP. Again, a debt to GDP ratio. And notice that there were three peaks in that debt to GDP level among corporations, 1991, 01, 02, uh, 08, 09. And in every case, it was followed within 12 months by a spiking and a peak in default rates in the high yield bond market. That's the red dotted line. Fast forward to the current situation in the right-hand side of this graph, and you'll see that non-financial corporate debt to GDP is now at a new peak, far greater than any of the prior three peaks. And while it's hard to know exactly that number today, because we're still accumulating it, and it's being published by the Federal Reserve of St. Louis, it was around 48, almost 49% as of the first quarter of this year. And the second quarter, I'm sure, is going to be much higher, probably about 54%, because debt continued to go up and GDP dropped quite a bit in the second quarter, over 30% year-over-year drop. It will come down because the GDP in the third quarter will be uh, much improved over the second quarter but still quite a bit down from 
the beginning of the year. So the point is, what's happening to default rates now that this debt level is so high? Well, on the lower right-hand side, you see the graph of the um, default rate. And you can see it already is spiking. The last 12-month rate is close to 6%. And the projections are that it will increase to, and I'll show you those projections in a moment, to a higher level by the end of the year and into 2021. So history is repeating itself, which is not a surprise to me, although there were lots of skeptics that said at the end of 2019, this time it's different. Well, it wasn't, unfortunately. New, new slide. And I'll show you the relationship now between default rates and recessions. The yellow bars represent recessions in the United States. We are blessed in the United States with lots of recessions over the years. You can see that there were six of them and now we're in the seventh since the early 1970s. And notice, particularly in the last three before the current one, that the recessions were coincident with huge spikes in default rates to above 10% for one or two years just after the recession ends. So one of my definitions of a financial crisis, a credit crisis, is a default rate of more than two standard deviations above the mean. And the mean is again 3.3% per year, standard deviation about 3%. So two standard deviations is about nine and a half percent. And we are now moving up to that level again in 2020, as you can see on the right-hand side. So keep in mind that one way of defining a credit cycle is default rates. And we are certainly in a rising higher than the historic average default rate situation today, despite the efforts of the government. Next slide. Now, not only should you look at existing default rates, but what is the forecast? Someone once said, never forecast. But if you do, never put it in writing. But if you do, do it frequently. And there are lots of forecasters now in this hazardous profession of the forecasting default rates who do it and do it frequently. I use three techniques, something called a mortality rate approach, looking at the yield spread in the market and the distress ratio. Now, the mortality rate approach, next slide, has to do with an insurance actuarial approach to corporate defaults. All of us know that life insurance is available and you have to pay a premium. And that premium is based on life expectancy and other demographic factors of the population. Well, you can use the same actuarial mathematical formulas to forecast default rates, but instead of looking at gender or economic health, of people, we are looking at the bond rating at birth and the subsequent default incidents from one to 10 years after that initial bond rating, this case from Standard & Poor's. And based on over 3,500 defaults that we studied and well over a million, maybe two million now, corporate bond issues, we have calculated, starting in 1989, when I built this model, and every year since, corporate default incidents, given that bond rating at birth. So you can go to this table and estimate the likelihood of default given a certain rating at birth for, for example, 10 years. So. For B-rated bonds, that's the dominant jump bond, 
you can see in the middle of the chart down near the bottom, about 28% of B-rated bonds in the United States, actually in North America, including Canada and Mexico and Central America, about 28% of B-rated bonds defaulted by the fifth year. And the marginal default rates give us an, uh, an indication of how much we can expect in the future based on new issuance over the last 10 years. Next slide. This slide shows a compendium of about eight or nine of us who default, sorry, not who default, but who forecast defaults. Um, uh, and we, we're looking at 12 month period ending April, 2021, or in the case of some of them by the end of this year. Most of them, not all, but most of them are saying probably between seven and 11, 12% by the end of this year or in the next 12 months. Again, that is somewhat of a credit crisis. My own forecast was eight to 9%, and I included in that a discussion of the impact of fallen angels, investment grade bonds being downgraded, and I'll get back to that. Cumulatively through 2021, that's the two year cumulative, the numbers are enormous, 20, 21%, even if the economy becomes a slow growth situation in 2021, which now most economists are thinking will definitely have to take place because 2020, as Pedro pointed out, is likely to be a negative 5% or in that vicinity of uh, GDP uh, loss, not growth. Next slide. Let's look at bankruptcies. Now, many of you know, if you've heard my speeches before or attended my class, that my wife and I have this tradition of opening up a bottle of fine red wine, or when I go to Mexico, a bottle of nice cold tequila, whenever there's a big bankruptcy. But if there's two or three in a short period of time, we go to the fine champagne. And in certain years, like 0102, and especially 08 and 09, and again, I'm sorry to say, or I'm happy to say, this year, we were drunk all the time. So I know that sounds very glib and facetious, but as a scientist, we need data, and we're getting lots of data this year. For example, the number of Chapter 11 bankruptcies greater than $100 million in liabilities, and I only look at liabilities. Assets of bankrupt company are many times irrelevant. Why? Because they're not really worth that much when a firm goes bankrupt. But the liabilities are real and tangible and need to be met or restructured. 137 of these million dollar bankruptcies, sorry, 100 million dollar bankruptcies, 137 by the end of August, so far. Extrapolated number 205. Although we have observed a drop in the growth of this number in the last several weeks. At any rate, there's no question it will break the all-time record of 153 back in 09. Historic average, only 78 per year. So we are already at 137 this year. And billion-dollar bankruptcies on the right, greater than 1 billion in liabilities. I call them mega bankruptcies or my, bankrupt, uh, my mega bankruptcy babies billion dollar babies, 48 by the end of uh, August, extrapolated to 72, again, easily breaking the all time record. So despite the government's assistance, and by the way, the US is unique 
well, I wouldn't say unique, but because Mexico is probably similar and Brazil, but many countries of the world, the federal government has mandated a moratorium on bankruptcies or, or defaults so that they could reduce the pain of companies by saying you cannot go bankrupt or you don't have to pay your interest. That's not the case in North America and South America and in most countries. And so, um, you know, it, I, I'm not saying which is the better system, but you know, what it does is breed a large number of one of my colleagues calls zombification or zombies, companies that should go bankrupt. They don't have the cash flow to cover interest payments, not only temporarily, but continually, but they're kept alive artificially. And this causes big problems, I think, in uh, global growth going forward. Uh, misallocation of resources and also deflation rather than inflation. And I'd be happy to go into that if we have time. Next slide, please. This shows the cumulative weekly growth in mega bankruptcies over this 2020 period compared to the two big years in the past, 02 and 09. And interesting, you notice that the 2020, which was 45 at the end of July, mega bankruptcies, did not start happening until about the 20th week of the year and then took off and now surpasses the other two. Next slide. The second variable that we look at besides defaults are recoveries. Now this is a busy slide. You may not, be, given that it's late in the day, not to be interested in equations, but uh, again, it's a study I did back in 2002, published in 2005, that looked at the default rate as an association between recovery rates. Recovery rate is uh, measured by the price of the bonds. These are for corporate bonds. It's a similar one for loans. The price of the bonds just after default. That's our definition of recovery rates. And those regression lines, those multicolored regression lines, represent linear and nonlinear regressions of the yearly association between default and recovery. And not surprisingly, at least to me it wasn't, but the magnitude was, there is a significant inverse relationship between defaults and recoveries. That is to say, when default rates are high, that right-hand side of the graph in the box there, there were five years when default rates were 10% or more. In all cases, the recovery rates were way below average. Remember, the average is around 45 cents on the dollar. In those years, it was 25 to 35 cents on the dollar. So far this year, 2020, with an estimate of 8% default rate for the year, which was my forecast at the beginning uh, in March, April, the recovery rate we estimate will be in the low 30 cents on the dollar. And so far, 31 cents on the dollar through the end of August. So ladies and gentlemen, when you are a creditor and you experience high defaults and low recoveries, at the same time, you're going to suffer much more losses, loss given default, than you would in an average or a below average default rate period, the ones on the upper left hand side here. So this is very important for creditors, for credit default swaps, for banks, for investors. It's also a great opportunity for distressed debt investors. And let me tell you, many of them out there 
are now saying finally after the longest benign cycle in modern financial history finally they're saying there's lots more potential investments for me and my uh my investors it may sound vulturish to say that but at the same time a distressed investor does not want to see the animal die before having dinner a distressed investor wants the company to be restructured after it goes bankrupt or after it defaults and see those value of those securities raise in value as the company issues new debt or equity or cash to the old creditors next slide now i'm getting on a different topic and it'll probably be the last one i cover before questions and answers we're moving from junk bonds from defaults from bankruptcies to triple b rated bonds the lowest of the investment grade class first let's look at the growth of that particular rating category if you go back to the left hand side of the graph in 2005 there were about a half a trillion of corporate bonds in the u.s rated triple b by the way at that time there were about 100 corporate bonds rated triple a take a guess how many triple a's are left in the united states well if you guessed two you'd be correct we have two compared to 100 triple a's less than 20 years ago triple a is no longer a coveted bond rating class i've done surveys over the years more informal than formal surveys asking corporate treasurers what rating would you like to be if you could be any rating and usually the answer was either double a or a after all they said even if we have a downturn and we get downgraded we'd still be investment grade well today the data shows the most popular class is triple b it's grown from a half a trillion to almost three and a half trillion in 15 years you can see that growth dramatically and triple b's today are about 55 percent of investment grade whereas before they were maybe 35 percent or so why why are we seeing this growth and it's not just in 2020 well the answer i believe is very low interest rates and if you can't grow your earnings per share as a company a tried and true method for increasing earnings per share in a low interest rate environment especially but almost in any environment is to lever up as long as your earnings your rate of growth of earnings is higher than the cost of debt capital so and you remember that from your corporate finance class uh have we gone too far and why have it continued to increase during a pandemic not just before when interest rates were low and growth was high because growth is not high now and yet debt is being increased dramatically so i asked myself the question at the beginning of this year before covid what would happen in a downturn to this <clears throat> triple b rating class next slide 
Some of you may remember, and Pedro was very nice to mention, that more than 50 years ago, we developed the now more well-known version called Z-Score that we built more than 50 years ago when I was a graduate student at UCLA. Little I know then, and I certainly am surprised perhaps more than anyone, that this model is not only still around today, but is being used more than ever before. Econometric models generally have a very short half-life. This one happens to have a very long life. And of course, I'm very happy with that, but at the same time, I'm cognizant of the fact that in today's market, you should use this model differently than when we published it 50 years ago. And I'll explain that now in case any of you are still using it. Five variables. Back then, the two new ones were the second and the fourth. Particularly the fourth one was the first measure ever in a credit study using market equity instead of book equity. And you remember that discussion earlier. Uh, but the essence of this model is five measures, each with a weighting determined by a computer algorithm called discriminant analysis, and ending up with a score. Next slide. Well, I decided that the score that we used way back in 1968 to differentiate between distressed and non-distressed companies, which was 1.8, is no longer valid. Instead, you should use what we call bond rating equivalents, and they're given in the second column. The last time we did it was 2017, actually it's in many of the columns, going back to the early 90s. And we're in the process of updating that through 2020. So if you have a score of 1.65 today, using the Z-score method for manufacturing companies. And keep in mind, the model was built for manufacturing companies, not service companies, not retailers, uh, not wholesalers, not energy companies. But if you had a score of 1.8 then, you were in a distress zone and everybody went bankrupt below 1.8 back in the 60s. Today, it's a very common score. Look at the B-rated category. 1.65 is the average. And I, we, we saw that 28% fail by the fifth year, but 72% don't. Now a score of about zero is a good cutoff score for saying a firm looks like a defaulted company. Next slide shows you another model I built. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Called the Z double prime score model. And actually I built it with Mexico in mind, Pedro. I was doing some consulting for Solomon Brothers back in the uh, 1994, just around the time of the uh, tequila crisis. And uh, the people at Solomon asked me, could I build a model for em emerging market debt, corporate debt issued by emerging market companies. At that time, all of them, just about all of them, except for maybe Chile, I'm not even sure about that were non-investment rate. And I said, well, I don't have a model for Latin American, particularly uh, Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico uh, debt, but I have a model that I could use for uh, emerging markets, perhaps. And that's the Z double prime. It doesn't have a fifth variable, has a constant term. And that model, is now the one I use for non-manufacturers and for emerging market debt. Next slide, please. And this shows you the bond rating equivalents with pluses and minuses of um, the uh, Z double prime score model. So I asked the question back in mid 2019, and I actually debated this with some of my colleagues on a uh, advisory council to Standard & Poor's, 
what would be the impact on triple B rated debt in the next downturn? I didn't know what the catalyst would be for that downturn or when it would take place. And most of the rating agencies, in fact, all of them, every one of them said maybe 10% would be downgraded to fallen angels over a two year or three year period, depending on the length of the downturn. I said, really, only 10%, huh? Well, let's take a look at what the Z-score was saying about companies rated triple B at the end of 2019. Next slide. Applying the Z to manufacturing firms and the Z double prime to all firms, we concluded that 35% of triple Bs had a bond rating equivalent below triple B. They were vulnerable even then. Well, I knew that 35% would not be downgraded. No way. Rating agencies really are very um, reticent about downgrading fallen angels, unless things are quite dramatic. But I felt it would be more than 10%. Next slide. This shows you a fairly significant number of pretty well-known companies that were triple B in December, 2019. Ford Motor Company, Occidental Petroleum, Continental Resources, Delta Airlines, Macy's, Marks and Spencer, Pemex, yes, Pemex, Rolls-Royce, all triple B. Of course, Pemex, was triple B because of the sovereign ceiling of Mexico. Now, all of them have been downgraded in 2020. Let's take a look at their Z-score, bond rating equivalent in 2019. That's the third column from the right. Double C, double C, double C, B minus, triple C, B plus, triple C, double B, B, and so on. Every one of them where we could get a stock price, to me, looked like a fallen angel before it became a fallen angel. And the Z double prime, while a few of them looked like, um, uh, triple B's. Uh, most of them also look like below. So far this year, and depending on who you ask, the numbers are different, well over 200 billion have been downgraded to non-investment grade. If this keeps up, we may get 600 billion is what I thought. And ladies and gentlemen, $600 billion being downgraded over two years will increase the high yield market by more than a third from about 1.5 trillion to well over 2 trillion. Just with the downgrades, imagine all the other new issues. And by the way, this is related to my initial quest, uh, question about corporate America being over levered. Who would have thought that during the recession pandemic period, there would be this enormous increase, as I showed you before, in both investment grade and non-investment grade debt. So far this year, close to $300 billion have been issued in junk bonds in the US alone. It will easily break the all time record in a recession. Never before have we seen it. And I'll come back to that point at the very end, and I'm almost there. 
So to conclude about these triple B fallen angels and the use of Z-score, a clear-eyed objective test about ratings and rating equivalents. We are experiencing, although it has dropped in the last few months, I must admit, these downgrades. I think there will be another spike in downgrades once the performance of companies becomes clear that COVID-19 has really devastated a large number of companies. Not all, but a large number particularly in oil and gas, in restaurants, in retail, in communication companies. And as you can see, a lot of those are in that third column there about industries having trouble. Transport, energy, real estate, capital goods, even in some auto related companies. Next slide. This shows the leverage loan market, another leverage finance area, and the percent that are now uh, triple C or below, and it's about 15% of the portfolios of leveraged loans. Uh, and in CLOs, next slide, please. You can see the growth of CLOs, uh, a structured product in the US and uh, and particularly U.S. and also Europe, the growth since um, 2013. Now probably 700 billion in the U.S. alone in a leverage uh, of CLOs compared to a leverage loan market of about 1.3 trillion. So it's by far dominating the industry. But what happens when they get into trouble with defaults? Could be a big problem and it already is in some cases. Next slide. This will be the last slide I show you before we take the Q&A. Now this is not my slide, but I was shocked to see it when it came out. And you can see the sources at the bottom, mainly Deutsche Bank's Global Research Group. It shows the percentage of US companies called zombies in this case. And these are companies that have, are listed on the stock exchange that have been around for at least 10 years, so they're not new companies, but have for the last three years, earnings that do not, are not sufficient to cover their interest payments. The coverage ratio is less than one. Again, it's not the only definition of a zombie, but it is one. Long-term companies that have not covered their interest. Maybe they've covered it with cash flow a little bit or by selling assets or simply by issuing new debt to cover the old debt interest payments. This is particularly true in Europe and has been for many years. I don't know about Latin America, but do banks make loans to companies just to pay their interest so they won't have to write them off? Certainly that takes place in Europe. And I think it's happening here. But the astonishing number here is that almost 20%, according to Deutsche Bank, of US listed companies rated in 10 years and having interest payment greater than their earnings almost 20% of all companies are what they call zombies. I'm astonished that it's that high. I knew it was high, but not that high. So with that, let me go to the very last slide of my deck. Keep going, uh, Erica. I wanna go to the last slide. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Some observations. High yield bond new issuance during the pandemic, exceeding any period in history, never before, up 65% versus 2019. Investment grade new issuance up 72%. Uh, 
compared to 2019. Corporate bond market prices rebounded to normal levels, even in a recession. Default rates trending up despite new issuance and high liquidity and stock market booming. The next bullet is a big reason why we've seen this upsurge in debt, upsurge in stock prices, upsurge in new issuance, both investment grade and not. Unprecedented support from the US Central Bank and not just the US, several other countries, Europe as well, and congressional. Well, we are now going through a difficult period where the Congress can't get together to issue more support for all types of people and companies. But as Pedro mentioned at the beginning, the US support is been significant, 30, 40% of GDP, three, four trillion dollars. And I thought it was certainly gonna be more, maybe not before the election, but we'll see. Successful? Absolutely. Look at stock prices, look at bond prices, look at new issuance. But with unintended consequences of this huge buildup in debt, even more than it was in 2019 that I started my talk on. Large mega bankruptcies and non-financial corporate debt rising in my opinion, to alarming levels. Is this a debt bubble? Well, time will tell, but I'm certainly concerned that it is. With that sobering note, oh, let me just uh, not end here. Let's say one more thing. Of course, there may be a question on this. So they can say, okay, so you've painted a very bleak picture. What should firms do about this? Well, here's one idea. When stock prices are high, start issuing equity. Don't buy back your equity, issue more equity. Get that debt equity ratio down. I must say, I was very impressed, even though it may have been for other reasons, recently by a newspaper article that I read about Tesla. You know, that famous US electric car company saying that they would be issuing or hope to issue $500 billion worth of equity in the coming months. They may have said this just for publicity purposes, but it's the right thing to do. And there should not be the only one. The problem is a lot of companies, stock prices has not gone up nearly as much as the overall stock market. And it's very costly to issue equity when your stock price is down 20, 25% from what it was in March. So with that sobering note, Pedro, thanks everybody for your patience. I know I've gone over more than I should have, but if you're still hanging in there, Let's do some Q&A. Thank you, Professor, and uh, thank you so much for that insightful uh, presentation. presentation. Uh, we do have a number of questions, uh, very interesting ones. I'll try to summarize some of them. Um, very interesting. Uh, so given, given uh, how high the default rate could go in the absence um, of uh, stimulus, as you know, we haven't presented Stimulus so far, as you said, 30 to 40 percent of GDP in the U.S. Uh, but uh, during the last uh, uh, congressional meetings, it's been like lagging, and uh, there's been probably more uh, fiscal policy fatigue there. Uh, uh, so going forward, uh, what what do you expect, uh, and uh, whether whether those uh, approvals will be more relevant, and where where does the default rate could go? in the absence of any of those approvals in the in Congress? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, Pedro, or whoever asked it, um, for two reasons. First, uh, I must say I'm um, a bit surprised that the default rate rate of growth has diminished in the last couple of weeks. 
and maybe it will continue to be lower than say the, for the last four or five months, uh, but it's still going to be eight to 10% for the year and 20% perhaps for two years. Now, um, uh, given the fact that the stimulus does not seem to be coming, who's gonna be hit hardest by that? I think it's the small and medium sized firms. The big ones already have failed because that's part of their corporate strategy, believe it or not. You know, there are great benefits to going bankrupt. Great benefits. I believe sincerely that General Motors is a vi viable company today only because it went bankrupt. All of the airlines, despite having great problems now, are much better off because they went bankrupt in the past. And so a lot of that has taken place with the big ones already. But the small and medium-sized firms, they were the ones that got assistance before. And now it looks like they'll get, they may get some more, but not really at the level they had before. Believe it or not, small company bankruptcies and personal bankruptcies are down 25% from last year. Down because of that stimulus before. That's all going to change. The bankruptcy rate of smaller companies, medium size, and particularly personal bankruptcies, I'm afraid are going to spike a lot. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, the bankruptcy courts are going to be more busy than they have been up to now, except in certain locations like Southern District of Texas with energy companies and Delaware with big ones and New York Southern District with big ones. But overall, the bankruptcy courts have not been that busy except for the big companies. Now it's going to permeate down to the others, in my opinion. So another quite interesting question. I mean, given, given the, where the level of uh, default rates are right now, uh, it seems <clears throat> the investors are not necessarily uh, compensated uh, for investing in high yield given I think the yield is about five to six percent and the default rate is about between eight to eleven percent. Um, do you think uh, investors should be uh, compensated or have a higher uh, sort of premium for, for investing in high yield? Absolutely. I am really surprised. You know, uh, the, the Fed's uh, support by buying uh, corporate debt, ETFs of fixed income, uh, government bonds, obviously, and distressed debt of, uh, in the past of financial institutions. Uh, that's played a big role, big role. But investors, I think, are either blinded by that support or what we're observing is a bifurcation in the market. What I mean by that is the more quality companies, the quality junk or the quality investment grade, they're being helped the most. Junk bonds, you know, you can have high quality junk bonds, double B, Bs that are pretty good companies. The triple Cs and the zombies if we look at their risk premium, it's much higher, maybe as much as over a thousand basis points rather than 500. But overall, I would agree with the question. I think the risk premium in the market is too low for junk bonds of around 5% now or 5.3 compared to uh, the historic average of about that amount. But don't forget the historic average is only 3.3% defaults. And we're talking about eight to 10% defaults. So something is screwing out there. And uh, uh, I'm not bullish about the average, but I, I love the idea of quality junk. As you probably know, Pedro, because yeah. we've we discussed that. Absolutely. Yeah, so I guess uh, there's another interesting question. Um, so. You know, uh, there's been, uh, so given that it seems like that you're saying we're in a dead bubble. Um, so the question is, where, 
so if companies we have record issuance of of um, investment grade and high yield bond uh, during this year i think investment grade we there's an issue on about 1.5 trillion dollars and high yield about uh, the 300 400 billion dollars so are u.s companies will, will u.s companies uh, are, are they going to be able to pay the, the debt in the future i mean how how are they going to come out of this COVID crisis more with more leverage uh, and, and will they be able to to uh, uh, comply with the debt payments and stuff well, of course, that's that's a great question, and that's uh, the implication of a debt bubble that it will burst. And when a bubble bursts, it means that everybody uh, will have problems. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, the ones that are most vulnerable, those zombies, for example. Uh, so some will be able to pay. Yes, one of the reasons why we've seen so much debt increase, uh, by the way, is companies are not stupid. They're building up their cash reserves in case this continues too much longer and their cash flows from operations are not sufficient, but they'll have cash. So the net debt of these companies is not as great as the debt level implies. They're not dumb, they, they, but here's the point. Companies that have really built up that, for example, Ford Motor Company, one of those fallen angels, issued $8 billion worth of debt just recently, over the you know recent months. Um, and uh, Delta Airlines you know, continues to issue debt. They're quality companies from a standpoint of, or at least the market feels it, from the standpoint of their credit worthiness. And therefore, uh, um, they will continue. And as long as the market is liquid, even those that don't have sufficient cash flow to pay their interest will be able to pay off their principal and debt on a timely basis. But what's going to happen when that liquidity dries up? Then the truth or the as they say, the truth of the model will be in the, the eating, the pudding, so to speak. And I'm afraid there's gonna be a big spike in defaults uh, of companies that probably deserve to default already, but deserve in a sense of cash flows, but didn't because of the um, incredible liquidity and the low interest rates. So investors are looking for yield, even among the risky debt, and they're becoming too complacent. That's what I meant by unintended consequences. Yeah, and, and on that note, uh, that would be interesting if, if, you could, if you can elaborate more uh, on those unintended consequences and in particular on emerging markets. I mean, do you see any, any sort of um, impact uh, in emerging markets uh, beyond the US or even in Europe if you have any view as well? Well, I haven't studied the emerging markets as carefully as I think uh, uh, many of you have, if you're from Latin America, for example. Um, so I don't really, haven't done the kind of Z-score analysis on companies in uh, Latin America, for example, or in other emerging markets. But I have to believe there's going to be big problems there too. COVID-19 has devastated economies globally. And while the U.S., as you showed, may have a negative 5% GDP by the end of the year, I think the emerging markets probably average is going to be down 10 to 15%. Right. And 10 to 15% is a huge hit. And yes, okay, there'll be recovery if the pandemic ends with the proven and successful vaccine. And assuming it will permeate down to emerging markets, which is a big assumption uh, uh, that it will happen and happen you know, in a cost-effective way. But emerging markets, unfortunately, have a lot of poverty. And uh, even if they are overall growing, uh, and we have seen that poverty and low-income individuals suffer much more and those companies, especially small and medium-sized firms in these countries. Now we have a model 
for emerging for uh, small and medium sized firms that uh, uh, I helped build uh, for a firm called Wiser Funding in London. And uh, we are seeing an alarming drop in credit scores of small and medium sized companies all over the world, developed and undeveloped countries. Uh, and some of them will not recover. Uh, so yeah, it's gonna be a, a tough thing because they can't issue new equity like the big companies that are listed. Uh, and um, the governments don't have the resources to support them like, for example, the wealthy countries. Even if we have a dysfunctional Congress that can't get their act together, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, we, are, we are really dysfunctional in that respect. Uh, and uh, it almost seems that the Congress doesn't really care, li really care about individuals and small companies. All they care about is, you know, uh, you know uh, whose fault it is. So it's unfortunate, really unfortunate. But, uh, la um, but uh, I think there are enough researchers out there in Mexico, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Chile, et cetera, et cetera, to actually look at the health of the private sector. I've always felt, and I know I'm elaborating too much, but I've always felt one of the great indicators of the health of a country is the health of the private sector in that country. And what better way to measure the health of the private sector to a bankruptcy prediction model. And uh, I've actually worked on with uh, Herbert Riken out of uh, the Netherlands on building sovereign risk models. And I'm afraid that the sovereign risk models, for example, Brazil, we felt Brazil was going to have big problems long before, long before it happened in Brazil. We're talking about four or five years ago, when it first indicated that Brazil was having a very low overall, uh, if you will, emerging market credit score for companies. So that's my answer. There are gonna be problems. I, uh, they need help. And unfortunately, the countries don't have the resources probably to do much, except for maybe uh, you know, a, a country that uh, maybe like Brazil, uh, and Argentina uh, and Mexico. Uh, Mexico should do more for its companies, I feel. Uh, uh, I'm not sure the mechanism down there, you know better than I, but they should do more because uh, they need help in this period. Yep, I agree. Uh, actually, the, the support level is 1.5% of GDP, so it's uh, one of the lowest probably in Latin America. I think Brazil is around 5% of GDP, the stimulus, so uh, there's plenty of things that need to be done uh, down here. So absolutely, you're right, Professor. Uh, one, one last question, um, you know, so I want to get over the time. Uh, and it's a very common and very interesting question. What would you, what would you think about um, a low interest rate environment? I mean, can the, how, for how long can the Fed go in this direction? And do you have any, any perspective by, by this uh, environment in a low interest rate environment? Yeah, they can go a long time, and I think they will. Uh, this is really the paradox. You know, fighting inflation is no longer a, a major objective of central banks. Uh, in fact, most of them talk about, oh, wouldn't it be great to have more inflation? That, that, isn't that amazing? Who, whoever heard a central banker saying that before? But that's what they've been saying for years in Europe and in uh, Japan. Uh, but look at Japan, it's had low interest rates forever and its growth has been poor. Uh, low interest rates is not gonna do it. It's not enough. Fiscal policy is very important. And here's one other thing. If you have a lot of zombies out there, low interest rates are not gonna help them that much. <clears throat> and secondly, just think of a zombie company that's a pretty big company, say. And it says, oh my goodness, I'm not doing well. 
I got to increase my sales, my revenues to survive. So they lower prices of their goods and services. But the healthy firms that compete with them saying, wait a second, the zombie has lowered its price. I'm going to lower my price too to compete with them. Hmm? Take Walmart, take Amazon competing with their competitors. And if I lower my prices to get market share, look at the price level. And that's one of the reasons we have deflation rather than inflation in the world. Too many zombies. It's not the only reason. You know, the central banks deserve a lot of credit, but also a lot of blame potentially for the lack of real growth. Thank you very much for great questions Thank you for, for your moderation. Thank you. It's a pleasure having you as a, as a speaker here. And uh, it's a pleasure, everybody. Thank you for joining everyone. Uh, uh, thank, on behalf of NYU um, and also the NYU Club here in Monterey, we're, it's just an honor having you. And thank you so much for um, joining this uh, in this um, uh, COVID-19 and, and the great cycle. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you all. 150 of you are still hanging in there at the end. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah,